Life advice. It's life advice rr at gmail.com. Okay, we had a follow up here about the guy that was lying. The father was lying to the yoga instructor girlfriend. I think he said he was 49 and she was 35. He was actually turning instead of 50. He was going to turn 59. I don't know, whatever. The 50th birthday party thing. Uh, this guy's chiming in here. 6'1", 185, 36 years old. Usually dominate and pick up basketball. Steve Blake-like game. You terp. Uh, can't dunk anymore, though. Also, old reference to pull-up discussion. I can do 25 real pull-ups. Wow. Mm. Thanks for even emailing us, dude. That's pretty awesome. Uh, can't lift worth shit, though. Yeah, that's just from 20 years of consistent rock climbing. I imagine... Uh, if you rock climbing for a couple of decades, your pull up numbers are probably pretty good. Yeah, rock climbing uh, he does guy, work. Rock climbing guy is like kind of my preferred. If I was if I was fit and in shape and like had muscle, I feel like that lean sort of just like rip look is the look I would go for. Kind of similar Sinui. to kind of rock star guy. Um, and you know I me, mean? I'm not a Vulcan guy, but like those guys are sneaky strong and they always do well in like nin- uh, American Ninja Warrior, which is really big for me. So, uh, just an observation. I like that kind of look. Noted. Um. He works in a D1 athletic department. Uh, I said his dad still shames him for not being a pilot. Don't all our dads. <laughs> uh, but I... <laughs> you know, a nice podcast, but should have should have learned how to yeah. fly a plane. Uh, I guess here, though, he's... Look, there's a reason. My dad was an Air Force fighter pilot. He met my mom when he was 40 and she was 24. He told her that he was 35. He was a badass dude, and my mom was a bit vulnerable at the time. She got pregnant with me pretty quickly, and then they got married. She didn't find his actual age until after she had planned an extravagant 40th birthday party for him with he and all of his pilot buddies. Don't know all the details of the incident, but I can imagine it was quite the party. Uh, somehow, they are still together. Not happily today. Wait, he said that? No. Yeah, he said oh, not happening. That's a bummer. What okay. do you think? I just threw that in there? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you were just ad limit about how they're like their lifestyle and the, and the relationship being built on a lie. No, I don't. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said, can you allow me a second to shame Kyle for his consistent take that you can't be a mature adult until you're like 30? Some of us have different priorities or know what we want at a young age and have the discipline and freedom to pursue it. It's kind of nice to ski double blacks with my teenage kids. That's double black diamonds. For those that don't know, um, not a big skier, but I knew that. Uh, double blacks with my teenage kids or do backflips on the trampoline with them. Not sure I'd be doing that stuff if I waited until I was in my 30s to get married and have kids. So, yeah, quick fuck you, Kyle, Wait, from what? that emailer. <laughs> not a yeah. good, not, he's not even here to defend himself. <laughs> no, but we just, you know. First off, to, to, Kyle, Kyle, he, he gets a bad rap. Kyle, I think is a, he's, he's recently engaged. I, I feel like Kyle's life's going the right direction. I, I'm pumped about Kyle's future. I think he's, don't, well, Kyle, I know you're not, you might be listening. You're probably not listening to this because you're just living life in Poughkeepsie no, right now. I but, doubt it. But yeah. I think you're doing great, dude. Don't listen to this guy. This, this is actually, this is a shitty way to start. I've been retweeting all Kyle stuff <laughs> while he's away. He's just shout out, I love Poughkeepsie. So I retweet that. I think I retweet Kyle more than any single person on the internet. And then he had another one a few hours later was like a sixth fiddler just showed up to this bar. <laughs> he's like, I'm fucking loving it. So how do you not retweet that one after you retweet the I love Poughkeepsie one? Like it's, you have to do both. It's hard not to be in a good mood around Kyle. I did notice that like the one time that we actually met was a couple was like a month ago or so when I was out in L.A. And he just makes like every like the frolic room people love him anywhere you go. He's just like pumped about life. I, it's hard not to be pumped when you're just around Kyle. Good yeah. vibes, guy. All right. OK, uh, this one's called Friends Drink Too Much. Gents, omitting the stats, nothing to see here. Looking for advice on dealing with friends of ours who seem a little too dependent on the old bottle, uh, being intentionally vague on names and ages to protect the innocent. We appreciate that. Some background. We're currently in our early 40s and have been friends with these guys for 15 plus years. When we were younger, living in downtown Chicago, we did your typical 20-something activities of playing intramural sports with drinks, taking weekend trips with the group with drinks, visiting our local water holes, et cetera. So, you know, but... To- um. I'm sure there were some excessive nights, but hey, we were young, a little tired the next day, but we all soldiered on into work and carried on. Fast forward to today. We're all married with kids living in this uh, living the suburban dream. We live within walking distance from our friends. Our kids are similar in age, and we tend to see them several times a week. Every single time we are with them, they are never without a drink. <laughs> if we plan an outing, it's always somewhere where booze is available, ballpark, zoo, BYOB to a playground. While my wife and I by no means are teetotalers, uh, it's getting to the uncomfortable spot watching our friends seem to drink themselves stupid and plan their every activity around drinking, cracking open an IPA at 10 a.m. on a Saturday, watching your kids playing um, AYSO. That just doesn't compute. 
You got any help for me on that? You're not a father yet, so I don't know if you can help me with that one. A Y S O. Uh, yeah, why don't we oh, look that one American up? American Youth. On this is. I don't know why he would say American Youth Soccer Organization. Why would that sound, just say soccer? It's not that hard. Yeah, just say soccer. Well, weird. Okay, that would help. Sure. Anyway, okay, so they're playing soccer. People drinking. Uh, while we've never seen them endanger their kids driving, passing <laughs> well, out, good. whatever. They, uh, <laughs> well, okay, that's we. We can right. rule that out. Uh, they seem to place their need for drinking way ahead of anything else. I'm sure they drive when they shouldn't, and we would step in if we were present when that would occur. Question is, is it our place to say something in fear of ruining the friendship? Is there even a tactful way of having this conversation? Their alcoholism, there is alcoholism in both my family and my wife, so we know how that conversation will go. But we can also see that their and their kids' lives are being dominated by this. Any thoughts? Uh, hmm. I, said, no, I don't know how you now. say, I, I don't know how you say anything to these people. Be like, hey, hey, you, you know, because I'm just telling you right now, like, again, if you're telling me they're all getting super fucked up all the time, like every Saturday and they're drinking early in the morning and they're going all night or whatever, like, are you around them enough? Are you in the house? Do you even know? But I'm just telling you, if you turn to a guy who cracks a beer at 10 a.m. for you soccer on a Saturday and you're like, hey, drinking a little early, huh? Nobody's going to want to hear that, yeah. man. Nobody's going to want to hear it. So what you're going to end up doing, because like, what do you think you're doing? Like, I'm not saying you're wrong, man. Uh, that is a lot of drinking. It's very different as I got older and I realized like how drinking impacts certain pockets, right? Where you're like, oh, this guy actually has like a couple beers and a scotch like every night. That's the end mm -hmm. of his day routine. He doesn't get drunk, but like that's sort of his thing. Um, you know, here's another guy wherever it's the guy's trip, like, you know, these two guys are going to be a mess because they're so happy that like that once a year they're away from everybody else. Then part of it's like, Hey, you know, can you try to keep it together for the night? Cause the night part's like the best part. And we want you to be able to kind of hang out and be with the rest of everybody else. And everybody's had their, you know, their night they'd like to have back and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know, like whatever this community is, clearly it's kind of like a drinking community. Like sometimes I would hear about different people that I was friends with. I'm like, what do you guys do? He's like, oh, the neighbors, we all pick a different house like every weekend. And that's kind of what we do. Like all the kids are friends. There's like 10 couples. Yeah. And then we kind of do our own little bar crawl. You know, sometimes during the pandemic, it was happening. I remember one of my friends being like, I'm drinking way too much now because of the pandemic because I'm never going to the office. And everybody's like, well, hey, we'll just sort of drink. And then he kind of knew enough to be like, well, I'm not going to keep doing this or being this guy. And then after he had like a little bit of a phase the first year of the pandemic, he I knew he wasn't going to have like a problem problem. But, you know, he was like, OK, I don't really want to be that guy that happens all the time. All I'm telling you is that they're probably going to get pissed at you. And I don't think your email gave us enough evidence that it is upon you to question the way they're they're handling their free time. Um, you know, like everything you just said there. Like everybody, a lot of guys, you know, you go through that post-college phase and it's like a weird thing where, you know, you, you're, you think you can kind of drink the way you do in college and you find out pretty quickly you can't. And then there's guys that go out both nights. You know, you live in the city, you live in New York, you live in Chicago, you live in Denver or something like that. And it's like, man, I'm out Thursday, happy hour, Friday, Saturday. And then there'll be a guy that's like, yeah, I'm only going out one night a week because he just doesn't like going back to backs. And then, you know, everybody kind of heads down whatever their own path is for, for drinking. But I have a couple friends where we knew like, this is really, really bad. And one, one friend in particular, and it's really sad and it kind of sucks. And he's not necessarily totally in the mix because he just cared about drinking way more than he cared about everything else. So it's fucking scary. It kind of sucks. And you're right. Like there can be little seeds planted where you think like, oh, well, is this a big deal? Or you look back and you're like, oh, that's when it was starting to get bad. And that's when it ended up being bad. I don't know that anything you explained here was bad enough for you to start, you know, kind of checking in with other people. And granted, if you've been friends with them for 15 years or whatever, um, I know it's just a really delicate thing, man. It's a really delicate, it's a difficult thing to do. and you know, maybe they look at you being like, why can't you relax and just have a couple beers, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know, man, this one doesn't feel like I don't have a great sense of like, yes, you need to tell this guy he needs to drink less and tell this guy to stop bringing beers to soccer and do all this stuff. Cause then they're probably just going to get pissed at you. And I would actually do the math as if like, would you rather not have these friends by proving some point? You probably would. Yeah. So maybe with whatever your, your gauge on them is, you know, it's maybe some people listen to this email being like, this guy shouldn't even be fucking talking about this stuff. Uh, and then, you know, somebody else could say, Hey, he has all this stuff and back understanding between his family and the wife's family that he's just trying to be a better friend. 
uh, this is a very, men are very, very bad at this. And I'm not saying it's right to not say anything. I'm just saying it's probably safer. Yeah, we don't, friendships. we don't have the proper uh, context and detail to really assess whether or not this is a massive problem. I'd love to know if, like, are you the only ones talking about this? Are there other people in the group or that are at the soccer games that are just like, what the hell is going on with these people? Like, they need to calm down. Like, is it, a, is it, is it awkward? Is it a problem? Um, or is it just you and your background and being annoyed and being a little bit sensitive, maybe rightfully so, about the issues of yeah, sure. alcoholism? Like, it's totally leg- legitimate. But then on the other hand, I just kind of think in general in society, we just we get way too in other people's business. I'm I'm almost just pro leave everybody alone unless it's like really directly impacting you or there's really something wrong going on. Um, who am I to judge someone who wants to have a couple beers at 10 a.m. to watch soccer? You soccer. It's probably I love soccer. It's probably not the most exciting thing in the world to watch like four year olds run around and play soccer. I, I, I I'm going to be honest. Like I I look back and I go, I don't know how my parents got through all the travel baseball bullshit that they had to deal with and you know driving hours and hours to watch kids who weren't going anywhere in baseball <laughs> and just do this like weekend after weekend after weekend so if you have to do something that gets you through that that makes it more enjoyable for you that makes your life better that's not really hurting anyone else like if you know that this is directly hurting people around them or their kids or the soccer organization or whatever then all right maybe this is a different discussion but that's not really what you said so I'm kind of just pro. Could you just could we just leave people alone and let them live the lives they want to live? Um, because I just think kind of we kind of get in each other's business way too much and tell other people how to live their lives. And I'm not even a big I'm, Ryan. I'm not even a big drinker. I, I'm really not. I like to in the right settings do it, but I'm not like a casual come home from work guy. And as you mentioned, have like a beer and a scotch. It's just not my thing. Uh, so you know, I don't. know, Maybe I'm the wrong person to ask about this, but I I just think honestly, just leave the person alone. That's what I would do. Yeah, this one's tough. It, it's just tough because I, I think the audience is probably going, you know, he's making tons of great points. And I think there's another large section of the audience being like, shut the fuck up. Like, what, who are you to say? Like the idea of me having a 10 a.m. beer on a Saturday and then having a couple beers watching you soccer, like then it's going to derail the rest of my day. I'm going to be tired. I'm not going to want to work out. Like I would just be like, I don't want to do that. But just because I don't want to do that, it doesn't mean that the other guy's like, hey, this is nice. Have a couple beers so I can get me through the day. Walk the kid back, yeah. you know who cares i don't know i don't know enough about it it didn't sound like it was remotely to the level where somebody needed to step in just because people are just incorporating day beers into their their weekend parenting so i think we got it yep i, I want to move on all right uh this one professional hockey dilemma 24 years old 6'2, 195 i'm an accounting student going into my senior year at university in canada and i play in the school's d1 hockey team i think this upcoming year will be my last year of competitive hockey as i'm graduating from school and i already have a job set up in an accounting firm starting in the spring the firm is paying my tuition to take an 18-month course starting in 2023 to get my chartered accountant designation however I will probably have contract offers at the end of the year from lower level professional hockey teams in the U.S. and in Europe. The offers would cover my living expenses during the season, but I wouldn't be able to save up a lot of money uh, and would likely have to work part time throughout the summer. I would be fine with quitting hockey and starting my accounting career next year, but I don't want to regret passing up opportunities to keep playing hockey, living in new countries and experiencing different lifestyles while I still can. If I can keep playing, would have to quit my job and start over when I'm done with hockey. And who knows who will be looking to hire a 28-year-old who isn't close to getting his accounting designation and has four months of work experience as an intern. What should I do? Uh, look, this I'm answering this based on age. If I were younger, I'm like, play hockey. Play yeah. until you can't play anymore. You know, I had a couple of buddies that weren't great soccer players, but the one played in Belgium and played like lowest level stuff. They played college soccer. They were pretty good players in the States. They were never going to play in the MLS or anything like that. Even never mind other clubs. They went overseas. They played for a couple of years. It was the time of their fucking lives. And then they came back and guess what they did? They got jobs. People paid them. They started families and none of it really mattered. Uh, I had another buddy who played professional American football in Spain after he was out of college in the late nineties. Um, NFL and Europe. He ended up becoming a major. No, it wasn't even NFL Europe. It was just a joke. Like he had a place in the city. Then they gave him some beach villa. They gave him two cars. The money was tax free. And he did it, I think, one or two years. It's actually Bill Callahan, who's the writer who was on Scrubs and oh. show ran up Scrubs for Bill yeah. Lawrence and everything. So, um, you know, he was kind of like, I, he would come back to Martha's Vineyard this summer and I'd be like, why would you not do that again next year? He's like, well, because I'm not, I'm not working towards a career. Mm-hmm. I think. The bigger picture with everything that you want to do, if you're driven, if you have goals for yourself, is you want to try to figure out a way to start the career path and not just the job path. 
And you don't sound crazy passionate about hockey. Uh, you know what I mean? Like that email, I th- I've heard this version of it before, buddies that played hockey at UVM or whatever, and they would sign up for whatever league would have them because they fucking loved hockey more than anything. And hockey is is different in that, you know, basketball, baseball, football, are kind of the same. But the hockey guys, there seems to be like a, a tighter camaraderie with it. It's a big part of the lifestyle. And, you know, to just all of a sudden have that be over right at 21, 22, which is what most of us have to do. Um, but, you know, I always think about like some of the guys that play into their late 30s. Then all of a sudden, it's like you're driving the kids to school. And like it's the first time ever since you were like standing upright, you know, four or five years old, learning how to tie your skates, that you're not in a locker room you know, a couple of days a week, you're not traveling with the boys. You're not constantly like having this camaraderie like that in itself. Shit. I, if I could travel for a hockey team, I would just for that part to have buddies, um, just be a hockey groupie, but it doesn't. Yeah. Just, it just doesn't <laughs> sound like you care enough about it. Like, I think you made your own argument. Like, why do you have to play to your 28 though? Why can't you, could you tell the accounting firm saying, Hey, I want to give it one year. Like if you're smart enough and they're willing, I imagine this is probably pretty normal, but they're willing to pay for 18 months of tuition for you to get this designation. Is there any way you can say to them, hey, I need one year of hockey. I'm going to play overseas. I want the experience of playing some more different. I mean, but dude, if you're playing in like some pen league and you're living in Pennsylvania, like, is that really some worldly experience? You know, that not really. I would think if you could play in Europe somewhere then maybe, but why do you have to play for another six years? Why can't you just play for like one or two? Why, is there any way you can work something out with the accounting firm? Maybe you're smart enough or good enough, or maybe there's going to be a total turnoff. Like I, this is going to mul- uh, multiple directions. I feel like because I'm older and the tone of the email, I'm leaning towards what's the fucking point of c- continuing to play when you sounds like you have something lined up and it sounds like you like accounting enough. You didn't say that you hated it. Other people would hate it. Uh, so as I'm older, I'm leaning more towards you going into the career with this setup and then paying tuition for this thing that you need. But I just wonder if there's a way you can come up with some kind of compromise, um, even though, you know, it's not going to be like, I'm just, I'm always big on working towards the career, not the job. And uh, clearly accounting is the career hockey isn't. Yeah. I knew, a, I knew a guy, uh, not closely, but knew a guy who good hockey or good soccer player in college, got drafted to the MLS, injured, um, his senior year. So he's, you know, he kind of derailed his career. He got drafted. He should have been a first round pick was a second round pick ended up like in one of the Nordic countries playing like the second or third division. And it was like a cool setup for a couple of years. Like you're living in Europe, everything's going great. Like as you said, a lot of times they pay for all your shit. They pay for your flights back. So it's actually pretty, a pretty awesome experience and stuff that you would never be able to do before. But I do remember when he came after a couple of years there, he was just like, what am I doing? Where, what am I building towards? And now he didn't necessarily have like the career, the next step career thing figured out. So you're already one step ahead of him. Um, but I remember coming, him coming back and being like, I just feel like I'm behind everybody else. And it really kind of bummed him out for a while. So if that's a problem to you, if you, if you like have this, you know, if you have this plan of what your life should be like, and you want to have kids at a certain age, or you want to be at this point in your job at a certain age, then obviously I think, you know, the answer to this question, but if that's not really a concern to you and you just want to kind of try it out and you'll feel like you're going to regret it if you never do it, then yeah, I think what you said, Ron, give it a year or two. Um, I mean, I don't know, like how much does missing a year or two in the counting set you back long term? Like, it, you know, is, is it worth getting a start right out of school and like being able to work your way up that fast? Or are you going to be able to just make that up in a couple, you know, like in like a decade if you work really hard? So I think it's kind of like whatever your priorities are. But I, I, I mean, I know if it was me and I really loved like playing whatever sport I could play and I could still hold on for a couple more years and still break even and have a good career. I'd probably take the couple years of playing in Europe and just to say that I did it. It's a great life experience. It'll make you a better person, to be honest with you. Um, so I, it, you're right. If he doesn't love hockey, it, as you said, it doesn't sound like he like loves loves hockey. He's just like kind of interested in the lifestyle. Maybe don't, but I would give it. I don't know. Like even if even if this job that's lined up, chances are like you have a you have a job lined up. You're probably pretty smart. And you're probably pretty good at what you do. So you'll probably figure out something either way when you get back. If they say no, if they want to delay it a year, so. I'd, I'd go for it just to give it a shot. You could always quit it as soon as you know. You can quit after a year and, and keep living your life and nothing really changes. So I don't think you have much to lose if you at least just give it a shot for one year. Yeah, at that age, I'd probably play. And, you know, it's not like sometimes you're younger and you have these like doomsday scenarios you're like, well, what if I go play hockey? And then no one will ever want to hire me. Dude, somebody's going to hire you at some point. It is going to work. And the real clincher and all this and maybe the tone of the email, I'm just sort of misreading the fact that he's like, I actually emailed in about continuing to play hockey overseas. So clearly I like hockey enough. If this is some sort of dilemma, I didn't know I needed to add another paragraph and ode to the game, <laughs> yeah. um, which, you know, Here's is totally on, fair too. Or I, yeah. On yeah, Gretzky. right. 
Like I sent in this email. Clearly, I really like hockey and I'm tempted by playing overseas. Uh, the clincher, to swing it back the other way of playing, because I still feel like if you're remotely talented, you're going to have a landing spot in accounting if that's what you want to do at some point. It's not like the entire country of Canada is going to go, sorry, dude, you played hockey for two years. No, everybody's everybody emailed each other and said, I don't offer you a job. You're never going to be able to have this opportunity again later on in life. You're never going to be. Nope. There's never going to be a point where you're like 34 and it's like, hey, you know what I should have done? Um, really, really slim chance that that's going to happen. But I do remember some of the UVM guys coming back that summer and you'd be like, how'd it go? And I'm like one guy's face was bashed in. He just was like, he wasn't skilled enough to be anything other than a goon. And that was like the only way he thought he could get in the league and he'd come back and his face was all fucked up and guys would be like, so pretty cool, huh? You're going to yeah. go back and play again next year? He's like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, pretty close. Think I could maybe, you know, get a two way. You'd be like, okay cool and you just were like this is brutal yeah the th- the guys that like do that to put off life that's that's when you're like all right like you know you're not going anywhere and you don't really have any prospects like you're just doing this because you have nothing else to do that's obviously not you your future's going to be bright no matter what like you i don't know figure it out do what feel do what's in your heart yeah, there you go do what's in your heart kid uh that's life advice thanks a lot to steve uh for putting this one together please subscribe to brian Russell podcast ringer and spotify 